Okay, so this uh, part two of this course, uh, we are going to cover deterioration of cementitious system uh, or the concrete. Uh, so we will be covering mainly the chemical attack and physical attack uh, of concrete. And in chemical attack, we will look at uh, what is sulfate attack, what is acid attack, and also alkali silica reaction. In the physical attack, we will be looking at shrinkage and creep mechanisms and also freeze thaw attack. So, in general, how the, this is how we will follow the uh, each individual uh, portions. We will first look at various examples or the, of these kind of uh, attack which has been uh, experienced by different concrete systems. Then we will look at uh, how actually this happens or the, the underlying mechanism of these different type of uh, deterioration mechanism and then we will also briefly go through how we can actually stop this uh, type of deterioration from happening. So, let us go into the sulphate attack first. So, what is sulphate attack? It is actually deterioration of concrete as a result of physiochemical interaction between the minerals in hydrated cement paste and the sulphates from either external or internal sources. It can be from either groundwater, seawater or industrial waste or soil or it could be some sulphate which is there within the concrete which is available for this kind of reactions. So, we will look into that more detail. So, what happens in this is here you can see this, uh, uh, this portion is the cement paste and this is the aggregate. So, this is a system which shows no deterioration. But after some time, you can notice that there is a slight increase in the volume on this side here, which is due to this expansive products which is formed around these aggregates, which also results in cracking of the cement paste. So, we will go more detail into these mechanisms. Before that, I will show some examples or uh, showing where sulphates are present in, uh, you know, or where do these concrete structures actually get exposed to sulphates. In groundwater, you have these different type of sulphates and also if you are constructing something like as example this bridge, it is going through this water body here and also there are many bridges which cause you know uh, very shallow lakes or even uh, or near the coastal region where there are so many places where we can have a sufficient amount of sulphate which we which can lead to the deterioration of the concrete structures. Now, uh, also in soil, uh, it is present in the form of gypsum, very small in quantity and then also we have a lot, uh, sometimes we apply pesticides, where would the pesticides go? They actually go into the soil and if you have some uh, concrete elements in that or exposed to that agriculture soil, then you can have sulphate attack in those kind of uh, concrete elements. And then if you are talking about industrial, uh, you know, effluents from the industry, they also might have a lot of sulphates which is uh, dumped into the either soil or some water body which eventually uh, will uh, you know reach the concrete structures which are on the way. So, there are various sources of sulphates which can actually uh, reach the concrete and then uh, damage the concrete structures. So, some of the elements which can actually experience sulphate attack, one is uh, concrete slab on grade if you are talking about either uh, you know any, anything which is kept on soil. So, for example, highways or concrete uh, pavements, driveways, all those which is actually in direct contact with the soil. So, as you can see here, this concrete is actually in direct contact with this soil. And if this soil is rich in sulphate, it will eventually react with the concrete and then create damage. Now, here there is another example which is a concrete pipeline. Again, you will have a, you know, uh, soil will be filled around this pipe. If that soil has a lot of sulphate, then again uh, you will have severe sulphate attack on these concrete pipes. Another example is the uh, lamp, I mean either a lamp post or a fence as you see on this picture, where this is actually embedded or you know uh, driven into the ground. So, if this ground, the soil uh, near this concrete element has a lot of sulphate, it can cause uh, damage, it will disintegrate the uh, concrete. It is another example where you can see it is a water body which is rich in sulphates and it the sulphate attack this concrete. As you can see very clearly here, 
the uh, portion of the concrete near the water body is degraded has been degraded much more than the concrete here so both these concrete were actually same but you can see this portion is coro i mean is uh, uh, deteriorated much more than this portion and this is another uh, example in north dakota us where you can see this this column here it's completely uh, you know disintegrated or you know there is no concrete or very limited concrete is remaining so this is again an example of sulfate attack one interesting thing to notice this is as you can see on this picture here you can see that the aggregates are not affected much it's only the cement paste which is in between the aggregates which de gets degraded and so basically the binder which is the role of the cement is a binding role right so that binding role you know it's no longer available so the cement paste is no longer available so which uh, leads to uh, you know disintegration of the entire system so this is another example where again a lot of deterioration near the soil or where the concrete is exposed to the soil here this is another example this is actually about 40 year old structure which you can see the uh, long view here this is a pipeline uh, carrying and these elements are supporting the pipelines and this soil over here was very rich in sulfate so as you can see on the picture on uh, the left side this picture it shows uh, heavy degradation of the concrete on the right side they actually used a better quality concrete which could actually resist sulfate attack so this indicates that we can actually engineer our concrete so that you can get a uh, better life or longer life so we can do many things to prevent this sulfate attack so this is another example uh, where uh, you know inside a house you can see a lot of so because this floor here is actually in contact with the soil which is actually uh, rich in sulfate so this sulfate slowly penetrated into the concrete and it started disintegrating then uh, and another example here where again you have a lot of precipitates of sulfate again which uh, you know uh, coming from the ground uh, below and then here another example uh, of railway sleepers or railroad ties where you can see a lot of this i mean uh, cracking on this this is there may be an effect of fatigue as well in this but uh, as you can see the crack there is no particular shape it's a you know random cracking so you can imagine something this type of random crack cracking is a, a demonstration of uh, some expansive force which is happening uh, everywhere inside the concrete so you can see this is like again a demonstration of a sulfate attack Uh, here i have mentioned here that it is could be internal attack in all the examples which we mentioned in the previous slides most of them could be due to the external attack means the self the source of sulfate is outside the concrete here we are giving you an example where the source of sulfate is from within the concrete uh, which we call the delayed ettringite formation which uh, i will talk uh, later more about that but what the point is it could be uh, the sulfate could be either within the concrete or it could be from outside the concrete now let's see how uh, what is the reaction mechanism uh, in uh, you know the, the sulfate attack so as you can see on this we are looking at chemical reactions and then what is the relevant factor in the concrete and then how we can control this sulfate attack or how we can minimize the sulfate attack so in the first row here you can see sulfate external going to sulfate internal what it means is if your concrete is exposed to either a soil or a water body which is rich in sulfates it will somehow penetrate into the concrete it might take several decades but it can eventually penetrate into the concrete so for that if you want to control this mechanism the main thing is to look at the permeability of the concrete or uh, you know reduce the permeability of the concrete in other words make the concrete more compact so that sulfates will find it very difficult to penetrate the concrete and how we can do that is either by 
using a low water cement ratio concrete and in maybe when you reduce the water cement ratio significantly you may have to add super plasticizers or sps and then also use of mineral admixtures like fly ash slag etc have also been proved we have proved that uh, they can also be used to reduce the sulfate attack so main idea in this first step is somehow the uh, we have to stop sulfates from entering to the concrete from outside so let's say whatever be the case sulfates have actually entered or it's available inside the concrete once it's available inside the concrete that is this here the concrete also has significant amount of calcium hydroxide available so this calcium hydroxide which is present in the concrete will react with the sulfates which is either coming from outside or which is uh, you know which is available inside the concrete it will react to form gypsum now gypsum and some hydroxide ions now what happens to this gypsum is this will again react with the monosulfates which is present in the concrete and it's monosulfate not sulfonate i'll correct that um, so monosulfate will react with the gypsum it forms ettringite so this uh, ettringite has a larger volume than the monosulfate so, so the the product here has larger volume than the uh, product than the reactants so because of its larger volume what will happen is uh, it will try to push the uh, material around uh, and basically it will create an expansive forces which will eventually lead to cracking so in other words if i can you know conclude this slide in the presence of sulfates monosulfates become ettringites or they react with gypsum to form ettringite which has a larger volume this because of this volumetric expansion uh, cracking of concrete can happen now again uh, before going to the next slide so here the relevant factor in this case is you have to have calcium hydroxide which is already present in the concrete again you can use mineral admixtures and slag to uh, control and control sulfate attack and then again another relevant factor here is the amount of c3a which is present that will govern how much of this is available uh, and then again uh, we can use sulfate resistant cement in other words the cement which has low quantity of c3a and what is that percentage we are talking about is about less than 7% c3a or if you actually make it less than 5 4 like that you will have a much better resistance against sulfate attack so lower the c3a content it is better um, it will have a better sulfate uh, resistance okay now so it just again once more to recap on the same thing sulfates react with calcium hydroxide in the cement in the hardened paste to form the gypsum which the gypsum reacts with the hydrated compounds to form ettringite and this ettringite has larger volume so this expansive forces results in the cracking of concrete this is depicted in this picture here where you can see gypsum is available gypsum is available here and somehow the ettringite is being formed so as you see in this picture this ettringite has is occupying this void space available here and you notice that ettringite is like needle shaped structure and this has a larger volume than the reactants so this you know there will be a stage where this whole space will be filled up and it will start pushing uh, around or it will start creating an expansive force which will eventually lead to cracks like this as you can see here these black uh, lines which is basically indicating the crack locations which is mostly around the aggregates because the interface between the aggregate and the cement paste so if this is the aggregate this is the cement paste there is this interface is actually having uh, all this ettringite will get or it will uh, start precipitating at this location here in the, but wherever the void space is available and eventually it will push and crack the concrete now uh, in portland cement concrete in during the hydration what happens is some ettringite is actually formed 
in the beginning itself during the curing process. So, after about couple of hours you can see that this, this curve here, this purple color, so this, this form, this is the ettringite and how much amount of ettringite is formed over here it is increasing, more ettringite is formed. Now, the problem is why there is something called a delayed ettringite formation. So, this is the primary ettringite formation which is formed during normal curing of the uh, high, uh, cement paste. So, it occupies its own volume. So, there is no problem in this formation of ettringite in the initial stage when you have a normal curing because the concrete is uh, not fully hardened, it is still it can actually uh, occupy that space without causing any cracking. But the problem happens or what we call as delayed ettringite formation, this occurs when the concrete is exposed to a temperature which is greater than 70 degrees Celsius, approximately 70 degrees Celsius. So, you can think about you know if you are doing construction during the uh, summer and uh, you know in the afternoon where the temperature of the concrete this is not the ambient temperature we are talking, we are talking about the temperature inside the concrete. If it is reaching more than 70 degrees Celsius during the curing period, then this uh, ettringite which is formed, it is actually, uh, you know, it will not uh, form fully like in the normal concrete and also it will have some monosulfates which are formed but which is occupied by a small occupying a smaller space and then the problem is later or uh, maybe after several years or even decades when uh, sufficient moisture and uh, moisture is available this precipitation of ettringite can happen or ettringite can form where in the voids and the interfaces present and now that ettringite need larger volume and larger volume than monosulfates and precipitates after the curing period probably even de uh, a decades later which is the problem which we say as delayed ettringite formation and the pressure which the, is developed due to this delayed ettringite is tremendous. It can really crack the concrete like we showed the example of the uh, railway sleepers that is a typical example of a delayed ettringite uh, formation because you can actually these railway sleepers are made by uh, steam curing and if the curing is not properly done or in other words if the steam the temperature is significantly high and not uh, well controlled and if the temperature is higher than 70 degrees Celsius temperature of the concrete which is steam cured then you can have this uh, ettringite formation at a later period where in this this phase here does not really uh, occur or uh, then uh, another example is uh, where you can how we can control this is reduce the water cement ratio. By reducing the water cement ratio you are actually reduce increasing the uh, resistance against the uh, sulphates or in other words you are actually reducing the uh, permeability. So, when a low permeable concrete you have as in the case uh, on the right side here, you can see the water cement ratio on the image on the left side is 0 0.65, over here it is let us say 0 0.4. So, lower the water cement ratio, uh, higher the resistance against sulphate and also both these were actually exposed to uh, were made of same type of sulphate resistant cement. So, what this slide is showing is that it is not just using a sulphate resistant cement at the same time you also have to make sure that the concrete is really impermeable and one way of doing that is reduce the water cement ratio or use very low water cement ratio and use super plasticizers if you have any issues associated with workability. Now here it says rating of concrete is 5 in 12 years and rating of concrete 2 in 16 years. So, this rating 5 means poor quality or lower the rating of concrete value, the better the sulphate resistance. Okay? So, both were both these concretes were exposed to more than 12 years still. So, this one even within 12 years it corroded this much, this is again 4 additional years that is 16 years and still you see less, uh, less uh, degradation. 
I mean when I mean corrosion in this presentation, it is corrosion of the concrete, not the steel part. We are talking about the degradation of the cementitious system. Now this is uh, another example showing how uh, the use of sulphate resistant cement and reduced water cement ratio can actually enhance the uh, resistance against sulphates. So here as you see on the x axis or uh, on the abscissa you have a, a time or exposure period and on the ordinate you have the visual rating that means higher the rating poorer the quality means uh, as you go down the quality is decreasing. Now here on this red the triangular markers you can see it was made of 0.4 almost 0.4 uh, water cement ratio all these are made of we can say all 0 0.37, 0 0.38, 0 0.39 so let us say 0.4 is the water cement ratio for this and then you have type 5, type 2 and type 3 these are the cements which Type 5 is highly sulphate resistant cement. So, you can very clearly see that even after several years, this red marker, the graph is showing high resistance against uh, sulphate attack. On the image on the right side, now you have water cement ratio is the factor where you can 0 0.4, 0 0.47, so 0.5 almost and then 0 0.7. So, you can see as the water cement ratio is increased, there is very, very little. Uh, or the sulphate uh, uh, resistance against sulphate attack is not that great. The green one shows very poor performance as compared to the uh, red one uh, or the, even the blue one. Now this uh, a combined graph where you can see both the effect of water cement ratio and the effect of uh, cement which is used. So here uh, this is a normal cement which ha might have more than 7 percent C3A. This is a moderately sulphate resistant cement where the percentage of C3A could be somewhere between 5 and 7 and here this is a highly, surf highly uh, sulphate resistant where the C3A content is kept less than 5 percent. So as you can see in this, the elongation over here, so what they do is they make some concrete speci prism specimens and measure the change in the length. So that is what this elongation means. So if the elongation is very little that means the sulphate uh, you know uh, resistance is very very high. So this uh, graph here the bottom most line indicates that as the water cement ratio is decreasing as you go to the right on this graph water cement ratio is decreasing and this is the sulphate resistant cement. So you can have minimum elongation. So the key point here is use low C3A cement and reduce the water cement ratio. Both these if you are doing then you can have uh, very good resistance against uh, sulphates. Now factors affecting sulphate attack this is just a summary amount of the sulphate present in either the soil or the water body around the concrete and also the amount of sulphate which is available within the concrete. Then the level of water table and its seasonal variation. For example, sometimes you will have a water table which is going up and down and or it's for example near the seashore if you have a, you know concrete structure or a, a wall uh, facing the sea then you can have tides so where the water level will keep on varying and as it is varying what happens is there is some wicking action which can take place or wetting and drying action which can take place which will take more and more sulphates into the concrete. Uh, also the flow of groundwater and porosity of the soil, then form of construction and then after all the quality of the concrete which you make or you can do the best designing everything on paper and choose the best material but at the end if you are not actually uh, placing the concrete properly, finishing and all that it is also very very important to get a good resistance against uh, sulphate attack in general the quality of concrete. Then internal sulphate attack the factors working are curing temperature and the cement chemistry. Now we will go to the acid attack next example uh, or uh, first we will go through the examples of acid attack and then how acid attack is happening or the reaction mechanisms and then some methods on or type of cements which we can use to prevent uh, acid attack in concrete. 
Now, what is the acid attack in concrete? So, it is the deterioration of concrete due to its interaction with the acid in the immediate environment. So, this immediate environment it could be either soil uh, or it could be either uh, you know uh, the liquid which is going through the pipes. So, we are talking either both inside the pipe or outside the pipe we can have acid attack or if you are talking about uh, uh, any industrial plants or wherever, uh, wherever the uh, concrete is coming in with in contact with the acid. So, one example is this is sewer pipelines where sewage it generates uh, you know leads to the formation of acids we will cover that later and then also chemical plants n number of chemicals you know different type of chemicals which are being produced uh, they all can have different uh, type of attack they can attack concrete in different ways. Uh, then so this is the example of sewer pipeline. So, this is inside view of a uh, sewage uh, you know sewer pipeline where you can see the top half over here. So, it will actually get deteriorated much faster than the bottom half of the pipe which is very clearly you can see on this pipe which is actually corroded and extracted or not in use anymore. You can see here the bottom half of this pipe is not that much degraded as compared to the top half. Here you can see the concrete cover is completely lost and then the rebar started corroding. So, you know for example, if this is a, sometimes we use pre stress concrete pipe also. So, if this happens in pre stress concrete pipe, it will actually really collapse, the pipe will collapse, it will not be able to sustain even uh, something like this, this uh, you know if it is pre stress it will just collapse, the pipe cannot be used anymore and then you will have to replace. So, when we say replace uh, you know that life the design life of some of these pipelines are uh, probably around 20 years or so, uh, but we have seen many examples where there were cases where we were forced to replace them within 5 years. So, there is a huge uh, issue regarding the quality of the concrete which is used for making these pipes. So, we have seen some examples where the inside surface of this concrete even though it is made using same concrete because of the uh, way in which these pipes are made you know centrifugal force they actually rotate and that is how the pipes are made. So, during that time the uh, aggregates there is a movement of this coal aggregate. So, what we are seen is the inside portion of this uh, concrete pipe or the concrete at the inner surface has a different property than the concrete at the outer surface. And we notice that the concrete at the inner surface is much more porous than the concrete at the outer surface which actually leads to very fast deterioration of these pipes. So, that is a major concern. Uh, so, we have to really ensure the quality of the concrete when we actually select uh, these uh, concrete pipelines for uh, you know sewers uh, I mean for the uh, uh, for use in the sewer pipelines. Now, this is another example picture which shows uh, that only the cement paste is being attacked aggregates are in good shape, but cement paste is basically the binder. So, there is no binder available that means this concrete is in very bad shape. So, you basically do not have concrete what you see is basically the aggregate. So, the near the cement paste near the uh, surface of the concrete is completely uh, degraded and it is washed off. Now, how the uh, mechanism happens? So, here what you see the picture is the uh, cross section of the uh, sewer pipeline. So, like this here and you have this bacteria which is present and it reduces the sulphates into sulphates, sulphides which so the sulphide is available here. So, you have this H2S emission from the sewage and then that uh, sewage corrosion through H2S SO4 or sulfuric acid. What happens is this uh, attacks this concrete here. So, you as you it is very clear in this picture this bottom half of the concrete is not attacked as compared to the top half of the concrete. Now, the sulphides which penetrate into this concrete and it oxidizes into sulfur or dissolve in moisture to form sulfuric acid. Now, the sulfuric acid is 
reacting with the calcium hydroxide and the CSH which is in the intact concrete here. So basically you have this uh, removal of this concrete layer by layer it removes. Eventually the steel reinforcement in this pipe will get exposed and once the steel starts corroding then basically it, uh, the structure fails. So that is the whole mechanism uh, of sulphate attack especially in sewer pipelines. Why I took this example is because this is a major concern in the industry. Like I mentioned where the pipelines are designed for 20 years but we are seeing failure of them in about 5 to 10 years. So we have to really work on the quality control of these pipes or use uh, special concretes for this type of pipes. So what is the special type of concrete? One type of concrete is calcium aluminate cement or concrete made out of calcium aluminate cement. As you see in this picture on the left side this is the calcium aluminate cement and this is a regular Portland cement concrete. So you can see on the right side there is a significant deterioration of this whereas on the left side you do not see much deterioration due to acid attack. These are some of the pictures which show uh, how these pipes look like and there are also other coatings uh, provided in the pipes. Now what is this calcium aluminate cement? So what you see in the normal Portland cement is something like this or ordinary Portland cement you have a lot of silicates are present and in the calcium aluminate cement the quantity of silicate is much much less. So you can see less than 10 percentage of silicates that is C3S and C2S combined is only less than 10 percent and the majority is you have significant amount of uh, C4AF and calcium aluminates. So we call this calcium aluminate cement and the binder here is CAH phase or high alumina and less silica. So instead of CSH we have mainly CAH. Okay. Now the advantage of this kind of cements, these are mainly used for repair product uh, as a repair material because of high early strength gain and uh, there is a phase conservation uh, conversion uh, which is happening in this type of uh, cement which is from the hydrates actually in, uh, in the early stage they will be in metastable stage and then they get converted to a stable stage. So what we see is even though initially you might have a very high uh, strength, you might see a loss in the strength. Okay. So but there are ways to control that loss also, use of low water cement ratio or fly ash or slag etc. can also help in minimizing this strength loss. So you can uh, design your concrete accordingly so that eventually you have the strength what is required. Now. Uh, Coming to the current topic, you have good resistance against the acid attack. If you use calcium aluminate cement, the resistance against acid attack is very, very high. The main reason for this is either there is no calcium uh, hydroxide or very little calcium hydroxide is present because like I mentioned in the previous slide, you have very less amount of uh, silicates and very high amount of calcium aluminate and eventually this lead to. Uh, you know uh, very little amount of calcium hydroxide available and then the converted phases are more stable than the unconverted phases and more resistant to sulphate. So even though like you mentioned here we mentioned that there may be a conversion which is happening which leads to strength loss but we have seen uh, literature saying that the converted phases are actually more stable and they actually uh, more resistant to sulphates. So in summary we can say that calcium aluminate cements can be actually used to uh, you know either make the whole concrete pipe or provide a layer of calcium aluminate cement uh, in this uh, concrete pipes. The remaining section we will uh, cover later before that we will take a small break uh, of about uh, 5 minutes and you can in this time you can actually uh, you know enter the questions which you have so that when we come back uh, we will look at the questions. Okay, uh, so we will go through the uh, question answer session, I mean uh, go through the questions which you have. Uh, question number one, is there any IS code specification available for durability? 
there are several codes available uh, which take care of different uh, you know durability specifications uh, if you actually search uh, just the durability of concrete and you know different different mechanisms if you look you can see guidelines on uh, durability uh, how to actually uh, uh, enhance the durability of concrete structures uh, the very good document which is available is by ACI or American Concrete Institute Institute uh, I think it is the code 201 or the guidelines for durability of concrete that is a very good reference uh, where it covers all sorts of deterioration issues. Now is it possible to control the corrosion attack completely? I would say yes it is possible uh, in an ideal world it is probably possible but uh, most of the time uh, we will uh, fail sometime but definitely it is possible to control the corrosion attack uh, you know if you are able to uh, you know adopt the best practices available we can do that definitely it is possible but when i say completely you know it depends on various things see one main problem which we civil engineers have is all our structures are not small in size we are talking about very large volume construction. So, it is very difficult uh, many a times uh, to control it completely. So, the word completely is quite challenging. We will have issues, but at the same time there are also solutions available which we can deploy. But uh, as a constructor or a builder at the beginning, you knowingly you can do, knowingly if you know what are the exposure conditions, what are the type of steel available, what is the type of concrete available, how to place all that and if you are able to follow the pra good practices, we can definitely control. Is there any accelerated test uh, that are available to check the sulphate resistance of concrete? Yes, uh, there is a, a ASTM test is available where they actually make a mortar bar also there is another test which uh, is made out with the concrete specimen uh, which is uh, concrete specimen and then uh, also then you expose that to a sulphate solution and then check for uh, resistance and you look basically the expansion of the specimen that is what normally the test is. So you look at the length change of the specimen and then decide if it is more it is if it is expanding then there is a lot of sulphate attack or you know if it is degrading uh, by look you can check that also and if cement ratio decreases cement quality quantity increases if the water cement ratio decreases cement quantity increases so as the quantity of cement increases so concrete is likely to get more corroded. Uh, I do not really understand what this question is, but uh, based on whatever I understood, if the cement increases, so concrete is likely to get more corroded. I do not know what that means. Uh, yes, one problem is if you have a lot of cement, you can have a lot of heat generation which can lead to cracking, which can lead to corrosion. So, if that is what is meant, then I do not know. But uh, see definitely if you are actually going for reducing the water cement ratio, uh, the mixed design is a skill. You have to work around uh, all the materials which are available and optimize the mix. So accordingly you have to see what is the best mix available. What is minimum duration for sulphate test? So there are tests which can be conducted for I think the minimum duration is uh, I do not remember exactly, but the minimum duration I think is couple of months at least you will have to test. But anyway, I will refer to the ASTM or whichever standard you follow. I do not remember the test duration. Okay. What happens to the concrete if it is restricted to expand even after internal sub? So, if it is well restricted, for example, there are you know examples of large bridge structures. Uh, where you have mass concrete that means the column size is really more than a meter or two meter uh, dimension. So in such cases what they are seen is even though sulphate uh, you know attack is there, DEF is there, uh, the load, the heavy load which is or the heavy stress which is acting on the column itself uh, that can suppress some of the sulphate attack. So in other words, 
it can suppress uh, you know the uh, deterioration mechanism but um, so it's all about the you know how much stress is being applied by the uh, additional lettering head which is formed and how much stress is being acting on the uh, structure so it's a uh, uh, applied stress versus stress generated equation so as long as you have more stress then it's uh, uh, not going to be a problem but again if the uh, sulfate attack if you are allowing the sulfate attack to continue to happen definitely there will be cracks inside which will eventually reduce the strength of the concrete and that is another problem which we will have so you you best idea is to avoid this internal sulfate attack can you please explain the effects of acid attack on top portion of so the effect of acid attack is uh, once the top portion is attacked by the acid it will uh, the concrete will uh, you know will uh, crumble uh, or get cracked and then uh, the uh, the rebar which is inside uh, the pipe that will start corroding then eventually you don't have any more uh, strength so the pipe is no longer good for use by using admixture we can control acid attack or not i would say definitely yes because by using appropriate admixture you can make your concrete uh, more compact so it will be difficult for the uh, you know uh, sulfates to enter into the concrete there there will be some control it will be better i think and which is probably practiced also in many places and the presence of aluminates will reduce chemical attacks but at the same time they will favor for sulfur attacks how can we compensate both so how can we compensate both it depends on uh, you know what is see whenever we design any type of concrete structure first thing what you have to look at is what type of exposure condition you have and design your concrete for the best resistance against that condition so for example if you have a sulfate attack in case 1 or if you have a, you know acid attack whatever that condition uh, is for that condition you design your make, uh, cementitious system in the best way possible that should be the approach you don't have to make concrete which will be good for all kind of attack that is probably not the right way also to uh, do you don't need to why the aggregates was not affected in the both case in both the cases sulfur attack and acid attack because the aggregates are very well resistant against uh, these kind of attacks so they are not there basically silica aggregates are basically silica and they are very really much more resistant to these kind of attacks than the cementitious system so aggregates are very good now by reducing the water cement ratio ultimately the workability of concrete is slow is low so to control the workability you have to use the right kind of admixtures so then only things will work so even if the water cement ratio is less it doesn't mean that uh, you cannot get uh, good workability you can actually use uh, super plasticizers or you know to enhance the workability with low water cement ratio it is possible so what people do is sometimes you know uh, make sure that there is a, the soil which is right in contact with the uh, road uh, if if it has a lot of uh, sulfates then you will have to probably use a very good uh, cement which is sulfate resistant cement or look at ways on how to reduce or maybe a provide a, a small layer uh, of soil itself which is not uh, having much sulfates but if you find that does the whole soil has a lot of sulfate there may be Uh, a better way of doing it would be to use a cement which is very uh, well resistant against the sulfate attack now gypsum is added to resist splash set now you need some quantity of gypsum is uh, def definitely necessary um, uh, in cement otherwise you know like you mentioned the flash set will happen otherwise so we have to use gypsum it's not that we can avoid gypsum So the other way of controlling this uh, attack is like i mentioned reduce the uh, amount of c3a in the cement and use such cement that is the uh, way to go minimum cover for rcc sewage pipes see this minimum cover i would say it's a designer's uh, decision uh, depends on what is the life which you need from that pipe and what is the quality of the concrete which are using 
So if I use a very very good quality concrete, I can reduce the thick cover. If I don't have a very very good quality concrete, then probably I'll have to increase the cover. So that depends on the purely on the what type of concrete is available, and then accordingly you will have to uh, design on decide on the cover. Now, how does how does calcium aluminate cement reduces acid attack? Okay, so that we mentioned that this uh, cam. Actually, when you use calcium aluminate cement, there is not enough calcium hydroxide which is present, uh, or very little hydroxide is present, and uh, the uh, uh, the hydrates which are formed they actually gets converted. But the hydrates which are formed when calcium aluminate cements are used is much more resistant to sulfates as compared to CSH which is uh, formed when Portland cement uh, is used. So that's the mechanism. Because the formation of acids is still taking place from CH. No, again, it will not affect the strength because you have you are designing it for whatever the strength is required. So, see all these type of questions uh, when in concrete technology, when you try to work on modifying one property, you don't really uh, you know compromise on other properties. We have to optimize the concrete so that you get all the properties or uh, you know uh, you know you have to really optimize for it that means when i increase the strength it doesn't mean that i should have a concrete which is not workable at all then i cannot place that concrete so i have to look at all factors and design the concrete accordingly so there is no black and white answer for most of these questions i see that but you have to actually do the trial mixing trial testing and then only you should design uh, you know or decide on the final mix which can be used for uh, mass production of pipes for example or you know very large structures so you have to do a lot of test in the beginning a proper mix design and ensuring that that mix will actually give you the properties which you are looking for is very very important what is and also you know one mix which work in a particular environment or a region it's not necessary that that will work in a different uh, uh, geographic location because you will change the aggregate, you will change the cement, type of cement is going to be different. So, you have to really look at all that factors for that uh, in a particular uh, scenario. What is concrete rating? This rating which is I think it is mentioning about the, uh, the uh, visual rating which are shown on that uh, uh, prism specimens. So, it is just a visually they have actually graded or rated the concrete from 1 to 5. So, 1 means very bad quality concrete and 5 means very sorry the other way 1 means very good quality concrete and 5 means very bad quality concrete. Uh, last question before we go to the next session, is there any alternative to rotary kin in cement manufacturing? As far as I know, I think all the cement is being produced by uh, using rotary kin because you uh, this has a lot of advantage because you can reuse the uh, same heat which is generated the preheating mechanism so as for uh, as far as i know there is no other option so people are actually using uh, and cover is basically depends upon the quality of concrete or relativity relatively is, relatively is code i don't understand what that means uh, the cover is basically depend on the quality of the concrete. Qu cover depends on the quality of the concrete and what you need from that concrete or what is the design life of that concrete uh, or in other words for the particular concrete which you are using if you want 50 years of life you will have to increase the cover or increase the cover let us say to some extent but there is also another reason you, have, you cannot keep on increasing the cover. Recently, I have heard an example where uh, 4 inches of cover was used. So, sometimes it is not good all the time to keep on increasing the cover. So, there what you have to do is increase the quality of the concrete and keep the same cover depth. That is that's the approach. So, we completed sulphate attack and acid attack. So, we will cover alkali silica reaction, shrinkage and creep mechanisms and freeze throw attack uh, now. So, for alkali silica reaction, what is alkali silica reaction? It is basically the chemical reaction 
between the active mineral constituents and the alkali hydroxides. So, this active mineral constituents what we mean is basically the aggregates which are present in the concrete will be if they are active aggregates or active silica reactive aggregate then they react with the alkali hydroxide present in the concrete and uh, form some gel structure which is actually which can also absorb moisture and lead to uh, cracking of the concrete like you see here this uh, gel this blue shape thing is a uh, uh, blue color thing that is the gel which is actually causing a crack in the aggregate here here also you can see the aggregate cracking so this gel is actually it's causing cracking and penetrating into and then further expanding so this gel actually can absorb moisture and also it can expand when it absorbs it expands and then uh, again tremendous pressure is applied on the aggregate or the system as a whole which leads to cracking and once the cracking happens then it can also lead to further ingress of moisture so that is additional problem which is coming up. So we have to prevent this cracking uh, one way or the other by using aggregates which are uh, less reactive in nature and also uh, cement with low alkali content. Now um, a holistic view here you have to have moisture or water and alkali should be sufficient quantity of alkali and the aggregate should be reactive in nature. Then only if all three exist then only you will have alkali aggregate reaction or we normally we call ASR alkali silica reaction because most of our aggregates are rich in silica. So the three uh, elements are uh, required moisture alkali and reactive aggregate. So if, uh, if you do not have reactive aggregates in your concrete then, then you do not need to really worry about uh, alkali silica reaction. So in some parts of the world we do not have actually reactive aggregates. So we do not really have a problem in some part of the world like in uh, uh, South India we do not see much of uh, alkali uh, uh, silica reaction. But in northern part of India there are some examples in some dam structures etc where they had observed uh, uh, alkali silica reaction. Uh, now this is an, a table where it shows different type of aggregates which can be uh, which can uh, have a deterioration. For example this first column it says time to obvious distress is just one year. So you can have or even opal that kind of crystals if it is present in the or minerals if it is present in the aggregate you have very short life. Like for example many part of India we use basalt aggregates uh, or granite aggregates they seems uh, not to have much of a problem with alkali silica reaction. So this is an example of uh, uh, ASR induced cracking where you can see there is no particular shape for this crack like we noticed in the sulphate attack here also you have map cracking we call it there is no particular direction so we call it map cracking uh, and uh, here this is another example this is a uh, barrier on a highway again you can see a lot of uh, cracks on this concrete element again there is no particular shape if the cracking is due to some rebar corrosion or something then you would have a uh, crack along the line of the rebar. Here you do not see any particular direction that indicates that the cracking is because of some reaction within the concrete not because of the corrosion. So when, when you say some reaction within the concrete that means it is everywhere in the concrete that reaction is happening and you have cracks everywhere. Now this another example so this ASR induced crack it can be so you know severe that you know you, you even be able to put your hand inside this is just example couple of coins being able to we are able to insert. So wide cracks are formed this is again a, a slab on grade where you can see very large uh, cracks and you can see a lot of cracks here a lot of cracks here. So these are all manifestations of ASR induced crack this is actually a runway or an apron region in an airport where you can see significant cracks here. So you can again uh, anyway uh, all these cracks there is no particular uh, direction and this is another bridge structure where ASR has been observed 
as you see on this on the right side of this column you have more cracks as compared to the left side and the observation uh, is I mean, this happened because you have more moisture attack through the drain pipe which is on this right side of this column. Here also in this bridge column and the face you are observing or you are seeing you can see a lot of ASR induced cracks but on the same bridge column on the other side there was not much crack that is because the drain pipe was on this face and not on the other face. So the water availability of water is very essential for the ASR cracks to uh, occur or ASR to pro, uh, prolong. So if we can prevent the availability of moisture you can reduce the uh, you know ASR induced problems. Now the pressure due to ASR could be so high that it can crack the aggregates also. It is not only the cement paste which is cracking. So here you have this uh, cylinder which is scored from uh, a surface where you can see this is the cast surface. So these cracks this is a close up of this crack here where you can see the crack is actually penetrating through the aggregate. So this portion here is slightly lighter in color and this is the cement paste. So means this is the aggregate. This is another aggregate here. So you can see very clearly the crack is actually going through the aggregate. Means like the first picture which I showed about ASR, the cracks can go through the aggregate uh, means very tremendous pressure. Uh, pressure is generated. Uh, so this is a also a severe problem. Once it starts, it is a big problem. And this is a secondary problem associated with this is that once there is a crack, then moisture can penetrate through the cover and then it can reach the steel reinforcement. So moisture can now reach the steel reinforcement and then steel will continue to corrode or start to corrode uh, once the crack. So cracking of the cover concrete should be stopped or we should not have a concrete system which can uh, you know crack due to this ASR or sulfate whatever so uh, chemical attacks which we were discussed we discussed earlier. So uh, we must have a good design uh, good practices at site so that the uh, ASR sulfate attack uh, you know acid attack all such problems are avoided because these cracks can eventually lead to the corrosion of the steel. Now again uh, all the three elements are required water, alkali and the reactive aggregates are required. So if you actually use only non-reactive aggregates uh, then you can actually avoid ASR induced problems. Now looking at what is the mechanism or what is the chemistry uh, or how this happens. So in cement paste you know that the uh, pH is very very high and under this high pH environment what happens is uh, the hydrolysis of the silica which is the aggregates or at the surface of the aggregates you have a lot of these silica oxygen and silica bonds. So this hydrolysis will happen which will form silica and then hydroxide these kind of bonds will be formed. And this will react with the cement paste uh, to form SiO. So you have this H is removed from here, which later absorbs or replaces, by, uh, gets replaced by sodium, potassium, and calcium. So the, you will have uh, this structure, which is actually a gel structure, and this gel can have a larger volume which will basically have expansive pressure or at the same time you can also have this uh, the, the gel will absorb more moisture and also swell. So there are a couple of mechanisms which people talk about. Anyway the bottom line is that if you have a reactive aggregates present uh, in a high pH environment and a rich in alkali rich uh, alkali environment you can have a gel formation which we call silica gel. And that gel uh, can have a larger volume or it will create expansive uh, pressure in the voids available and then eventually they will uh, or voids or interfaces around the aggregate uh, eventually they will actually crack the aggregate. So pressure is so high that it can actually crack the aggregate. Now how to prevent ASR? Uh, 
uh, one method is uh, to use less reactive aggregate already mentioned another one is to use mineral admixtures so here this graph shows all these uh, four graphs okay they all these specimens were tested like this where you have a concrete prism specimen an astm c1293 a similar test is also used for uh, sulfate uh, you know uh, resistance or for testing sulfate resistance either like this or a mortar bar test where they look at the expansion of the uh, sp uh, prism specimen so in this test you have this concrete sp uh, prism made out of asr with reactive aggregates means so here uh, asr in these graphs it the here these asr means that aggregates used were reactive aggregates that means you are inducing asr into the specimen or giving a good uh, favorable environment for asr to happen so you have asr uh, or the, you have the uh, uh, reactive aggregates and in the case series b you have opc cement or o ordinary portland cement in the test series c you have fly ash also and in the test series d some replacement of slag test series e some replacement of micro silica so if you look at this how the expansion or the you know, percentage expansion so they made concrete prisms with all these different uh, different mineral admixtures and reactive aggregates so all will have asr but what we have observed is the asr in the specimens with Uh, reactive aggregates and opc it was very very high as compared to the expansion in the uh, concrete with slag micro silica and uh, fly ash so here you see 50% replacement of fly ash so we normally don't go for this high replacement of fly ash so if you reduce this replacement you might see a little bit more expansion but definitely less than the Uh, expansion in opc specimens so this is a good way of uh, you know uh, controlling asr especially when you are talking about new concrete structures we can actually go for this uh, technique if you are talking about an existing uh, uh, like you know you found that the structure is already built and then there is uh, you know demonstration of asr then there is a treatment called lithium you actually impregnate lithium into the concrete into the cracked concrete surface which is expected to suppress the asr reaction the next mechanism we will look at is uh, shrinkage and creep this comes under the physical attack and after the shrinkage and creep we'll look at the freeze thaw so in the shrinkage and creep so what is uh, shrinkage and creep they are both uh time dependent strains and they there is an involvement of movement of water uh in the concrete now for specific if you talk about shrinkage the strains occur when water is lost so how the water is lost in concrete it can be either by evaporation or by some chemical reaction which is going on inside the concrete so water is consumed in the reaction so the shrinkage strains are not completely recoverable when the concrete is resaturated what it means is when initially you see a sh concrete shrinking because of drying or something so it's not that if you re if you soak the concrete again you will regain the original shape it doesn't always happen so there is some permanent deformation uh, which can happen in the concrete now in the case of creep again occur when water is lost but how is it lost it is due to the application of stress here it was due to either chemical reaction or due to the evaporation in the case of shrinkage or when you talk about creep it's mainly due to the stress which is applied into the concrete again the creep strains are strains they are not completely recoverable means when uh, some creep strain is there it there is a permanent deformation happening in the system so in other words the moment the load is removed it is not that the concrete will regain its original uh, shape or in other words the strain will not become zero now effect of uh, shrinkage and creep on different type of structures so what you can see here if you are talking about a concrete bridge column which is 
uh, experiencing a very large compressive stress uh, that can actually uh, induce some shortening of the column either because of the shrinkage because the concrete surface the surface of the column uh, you know water can be lost from there or due to the load which is being applied you can have creep deformation so anyway you will have axial compression happening in this kind of elements over a period of time you can see that the columns get shortened and when i say shortened it is not something which you can see with your naked eyes all the time but there will be significant shortage so that uh, can be significant shortage so that there is some you know uh, issues associated at the issues at the uh, support locations where the girder is sitting and then deflections can also increase if you are talking about any girder under flexure you can experience significant deflection if the creep uh, because the dead load of the concrete is always acting on the girder so because of this dead load you always have a uh, you know constant force is acting and under that uh, constant uh, stress you can the girder can experience some creep deformations and the pre stress can decrease with time as the concrete shrinks and creeps again if you when you talk about pre stress concrete structures you always the concrete is always under compression or under compressive stress so because of that uh, the concrete can undergo creep deformation means the length of the element can decrease because of the compressive stress which is acting and at the same time a uh, shrinkage can happen because this uh, the evaporation of the uh, moisture from the surface of the uh, concrete element now in pavements and slabs on grade cracks can occur uh, that are restrained and develop tensile stresses so which is very commonly observed on roads where you can see that uh, sometimes you will see the saw cuts are made or in a cuts are made at a regular interval on concrete uh, slabs or pavements so these cuts are nothing but place where we design the slab so that it will crack only at that uh, cut location if you don't have those then it will crack uh, irregularly or the play at the places where you don't i will show a picture later uh, on this uh, mechanism uh, where there is a crack which is away from the uh, socket so what happens is because on the slab because of this uh, shrinkage and uh, shrinkage forces some uh, regions will start shrinking and then the region next to it also will start shrinking eventually forming a crack in between so because there is a restraining forces uh, av uh, available and this will lead to tensile stresses and it will uh, lead to cracks in the concrete if there is no restraint then the whole element will shrink but there may not be any crack in the concrete the cracking is happening because there is a restraints uh, you know constraints on the element okay when various types of uh, shrinkage when does the various type of shrinkage occur so the plastic shrinkage it can happen in the very early stage that means when the uh, concrete is still in the plastic stage that means if you try to uh, push you know uh, try to uh, you know insert your finger into the concrete it can actually uh, uh, create a plastic deformation means it's not elastic in nature yet it's still in plastic in nature so if you deform the concrete it will it will be deformed it will not come back to its original shape so fresh state of concrete what we are talking here is first few hours until that complete setting uh, happens or until the hardening starts that is the stage which we are talking about and uh, that if the shrinkage is happening during that time we call it plastic shrinkage and if you are talking about a uh, couple of days there is another type of shrinkage which we call thermal sh uh, shrinkage or contraction then there is something called autogenous shrinkage which the time span we are talking is days to weeks to up to months uh, you know and then there is drying shrinkage which can even go up to years and then carbonation shrinkage which the the uh, shrinkage the uh, by volume it is or the by magnitude it is very less but it is becoming more and more important for new type of concretes which we have where we have large quantity of cement also being used 
Now, uh, five type of shrinkages as we discussed. Uh, plastic shrinkage, it is due to the loss of water in the plastic state due to evaporation or early hours due to evaporation. Thermal shrinkage, it is due to the decrease in temperature after the setting uh, happens. Autogenous shrinkage, there is a chemical shrinkage and a self desiccation mechanism. Chemical shrinkage happens because of the volume change and uh, you know when the cement hydrates, the volume of the hydrated or the product is less than the volume of the cement and water. Then we call it chemical shrinkage and if when we call it uh, self desiccation is when reduction, there is a reduction in the pore water because of the hydration reaction. So, we call it self desiccation. Anyway, the combined these two we call autogenous shrinkage and there is the one drying shrinkage which is due to the loss of water mainly the name itself says what it is mainly due to the drying or evaporation, but it mainly happens after the concrete is hardened not in the plastic stage. Then you have carbonation shrinkage which is volume reduction due to the reaction of the hydrated cement paste with carbon dioxide in the presence of moisture, where what it is basically there is a reaction between the carbon dioxide and the products actually uh, you know occupies the space which is uh, available in the concrete and eventually leading to shrinkage. So, this again just uh, one more look plastic shrinkage, thermal and contraction, autogenous, drying and carbonation shrinkage and this shows what is a typical time when these type of shrinkage can happen hours in days weeks months years etc okay now i'll show some examples of di these different type of shrinkages and then some uh, mechanisms uh, uh, happening so in plastic shrinkage uh, you can see more crack near the surface so what did this picture is a top view or you are looking at the surface of the concrete where again you see map cracking there is no particular direction. When there is no particular direction what is happening something is wrong in the cement itself. So, it is leading to this kind of cracks and this picture here again shows there is a crack here, there is a crack here that means this concrete is shrinking in this direction. So, the leading to a crack in this direction in the opposite direction or perpendicular direction. Now, here this is actually a picture of a core which was taken from this location. What you see here is there is a lot of uh, the crack width is much more at the top and as you go down the crack width is decreasing. Again an in, uh, you know demonstration that this crack is more severe near the surface. Now, the question is is it good or bad? I would say it is bad because these crack through these cracks you will have moisture penetration, oxygen can go carbon dioxide can penetrate all that can penetrate much faster through this and reach the steel much faster than in the case when there is no crack. So, plastic shrinkage must be prevented and this is another example of uh, you know driveway where you can see significant amount of uh, plastic shrinkage cracks and all in this <coughs> in this direction where you can see the dimension of this concrete element, this is longer dimension, this is shorter dimension. So, typically the crack is happening in this direction, sorry the crack shrinkage is happening in this direction and cracking is happening uh, in this direction perpendicular direction. Now, this cracking could have been avoided if you were designing the concrete appropriately and at the same time also provide. Uh, you know some fibers also in the concrete. So, this is an example where uh, how cracking can be reduced or controlled by the use of uh, fibers. This is a fiber reinforced concrete five FRC, two fiber reinforced concrete and one plain concrete with no fibers. You can very clearly see that in the plain concrete there is significant cracking and in this very little crack here in this also very little crack. So, definitely fibers are helping, but just putting fibers is not going to uh, you know serve the purpose completely. You also have to go for low water cement ratio, appropriate mixture proportioning and appropriate curing that is also very very important to reduce plastic shrinkage cracking. 
especially if you are talking about the use of silica fume uh, in concrete or more the fine material in the concrete, you have to ensure that the uh, curing is adequately done even in the early stages of concrete otherwise what there will be lot of evaporation happening and there will be more water demand uh, at the, uh, the top surface. The, once the evaporation happens in case of silica fume concrete if the uh, top portion if it is evaporating the water is evaporated. So, you have to actually re, uh, you know provide enough water for the top rail or so, top layer also to continue curing and when you have very fine materials they will actually block the path within the concrete uh, for the bleed water to come up. So, that is another issue. Uh, so, you have to ensure proper curing whenever you want to control plastic shrinkage cracking. Now, thermal shrinkage in uh, hardened concrete uh, it mainly occurs when you have a very thick concrete element where you can see a retaining wall for example, very thick concrete element you will have a lot of heat generation in such uh, concrete members because of the uh, large size and uh, plastic concrete can expand due to the heat and later concrete tries to contract, but then there are some restraints and etcetera available. So, because of the restraint only some portion can actually uh, contract and leading to cracks and typically occurs in walls over foundations because the earth below will actually function uh, like a restraining force. So, that will try to control some portion of the concrete from uh, movement which will eventually lead to uh, cracking. Now, a curling and warping of pavements can also happen uh, when there is a temperature gradient. This is a nice uh, you know real example to show how this uh, curling can happen and this is actually uh, you know you can see that the top layer when due to the expansion under heat the top layer actually uh, you know it is pushed off the uh, bottom layer. So, the what is the mechanism here? So, the top layer here if this this is a joint between the this is concrete section 1 and this is concrete section 2 and you have a joint here and uh, before the curling happens this is the surface of the concrete this yellow line here was the surface of the concrete before the curling happened and because there was some expansive forces these two concrete sections were pushing each other and eventually they just lifted up as you can very clearly see in this uh, picture. So, this is again uh, a very important uh, thing to look at. Uh, so, how to design these joints so that this will not happen that is an important thing. So, if you provide sufficient space here between these two concrete elements uh, or normally we fill that region with a polymeric fill uh, you know pad or something a filler material will be used which can expand and contract without creating stress on the concrete. So, that is the whole idea you should not create any stress on this concrete. So, provide a compressible material here which can be uh, which can uh, take the stress I mean which will prevent the stress from generating or stress due to the heating each other of this concrete elements. Now, autogenous shrinkage uh, again you can see here this is uh, unhydrated cement and water what is the total volume and now here this is the uh, after the initial setting has happened this is the volume of the paste. That means, some reaction has goes on has gone uh, happened. So, there is some chemical shrinkage or the reactants volume uh, is more than the volume of the product. So, this is the product volume. So, this much shrinkage has happened and if you wait after the setting complete setting is over then you have further reduction in the volume of the concrete and or the volume of the cement paste which again uh, reduces the volume further. So, now the total shrinkage is this much. Now, here you also have these air voids within the system. So, if you accumulate all that air void then that is this void volume here. So, total you have 
absolute volume reduction almost six, significant amount of absolute volume reduction don't look at this this is not uh, that you know there is a 50% reduction in volume it is nothing like that this is just a schematic this is not drawn to scale okay this whole picture because it looks like 50% reduction but it is not 50% reduction okay it's just uh, to show uh, an exaggerated drawing now what is chemical shrinkage the volume why it is happening the volume of hydrates or the products is only about 8 to 10 percent lower than the volume of the reactants or the uh, total volume of the cement and water. So, you have about 8 to 10 percent uh, reduction in the volume and uh, self desiccation further shrinkage can occur when water is removed from the capillary pores. So, very very fine pores further removal of water is happening due to the hydration of the cement itself or in other words the cement takes more water from this capillary force uh, pores for the reaction to occur. So, when we say autogenous shrinkage it is a combination of both chemical shrinkage and self desiccation and uh, uh, you know without any loss of moisture to the environment is how we actually uh, you know get that. Now, in concrete the autogenous shrinkage is restrained by the aggregates and the already hydrated cement because the aggregate in when you talk about cement paste you have this 8 to 12 percent of the uh, volume reduction, but when you talk about the concrete this 8 to 12 percent of the cement. So, cement itself might be about 7 to 10 percentage and when you talk about this 8 to 12 percentage of that 7 to 10 percentage of cement it is very very small uh, volume. So, that is why we uh, do not see uh, you know much of a problem, but definitely there is some shrinkage happening uh, which need to be uh, taken care of. Now, when you talk about drying shrinkage, it is a removal of water due to the exposure of unsaturated uh, air which is inside the uh, concrete, you have some uh, pores available or some moisture available which is completely removed due to the drying. And again once the sh drying shrinkage happens, it is not that you will be able to uh, you know get rid of that shrinkage by pouring more water on it, it is not going to happen. For example, this picture here shows the uh, drying shrinkage crack right here. So, if I pour more water over here, this is not going to close this crack, it is not going to happen. So, that is it is not reversible. So, changing volume due to drying is less than the volume of the water removed from the uh, concrete. So, uh, causes little or no shrinkage uh, if uh, initially you have enough uh, water, uh, you will have proper uh, curing can happen and then also this drying shrinkage also depends on how much reinforcement you have, how much the stress is being distributed within the concrete. So, temperature uh, so you can provide additional reinforcement to take care of this uh, drying shrinkage also. As what concrete is dried, water is lost from the capillary pores. So, you have very fine pores in the ca capillary, uh, capillary pores are available in the concrete from which water is lost and this uh, when you have this very fine uh, uh, water is removed from the capillary pores, it actually creates some stresses in the uh, hydrated cement paste, the remaining paste and if it le leading to some cracking. Now, drying shrinkage uh, in hardened concrete, restrained drying shrinkage, here we are talking about a structure. So, this is actually a floor which is uh, you know on ground. So, the ground itself is giving some restraint. So, you can see there is no particular direction on these cracks, it is cracking is happening in all the direction. So, you can see a small fine crack here, crack here, crack here like that and this is an unrestrained drying shrinkage where the cracking is uh, happening almost in parallel direction. Uh, Let us say you have a retaining wall, you will see that cracks uh, you know uh, also depending on the uh, dimension of the structure. If you have a very long uh, one dimension is much longer than the other you can have something like this. 
and at the same time if there is no uh, restraint then also you can see uh, something like this. Now a uh, crack caused due to late joint saw cutting. So here this is an example where you cut this is the saw cut but this cut was made after uh, you know not on, on time. So what happened is what happened is you have a crack happening here. So this is not uh, you know if you had a cut uh, before time you could have actually had this uh, avoided that. Now uh, this data shows uh, the shrinkage as a function of time. What you are seeing here is a data collected on an old concrete for about 30 years. So you can see when you soak the concrete there is a slow swelling happening in the concrete and when you keep the concrete at about 70 percent humidity there is some shrinkage but this is flattening means there is a maximum shrinkage which is being experienced by this concrete in about 20 years it is uh, reaching that maximum level. Now this is a schematic showing uh, uh, how the shrinkage strain and the creep, uh, creep and shrinkage strains uh, look like. So the moment you apply the load you will see that there is a significant strain here if you are looking at this creep uh, diagram significant strain and then it slow, slows down the rate of straining is slowing down and as you see when the load is removed you have significant recovery we call this elastic recovery. So this much portion uh, of the strain is recovered or means it is elastic it is recovered and then there is some permanent deformation happening that means this much strain is not recovered. So there is a permanent deformation is there even after the loading is removed. Now when we say this loading it can be either uh, the structural loading if we are talking about the creep, if you are talking about the shrinkage we are talking about uh, you know if you pour more water or get more ex, uh, moisture exposure that is that unloading uh, or resaturation is the term used here. So this resaturation is associated with this dash curves and this uh, loading and unloading is for the creep uh, behavior. The main point to note down here is par partial recovery of the strains are possible but not complete recovery. Now this is the how to control the crack these are examples of socket which can be made so that you force the crack to happen along or below this socket but not in between areas. Now carbonation shrinkage again uh, the surface zone of concrete undergoes shrinkage due to carbonation of the hydrated cement paste as you can see here uh, the shrinkage is happening when you have a significant uh, carbonation of the concrete. Uh, happens shrinkage is happening and uh, what is the mechanism is the carbonation increases the shrinkage at intermediate relative humidities and at low humidity there is insufficient water uh, in the pores to form the carbonic acid with CO2 and when pores are fully saturated the uh, you do not really expect uh, much carbonation. Now this is an example which shows uh, a concrete is actually a you know image uh, due to uh, using image analysis they actually converted the cylindrical specimen into a black and white sketch. So here you can see uncarbonated cement paste exhibiting no cracks when the cement paste was carbonated you see significant cracking happening. So here you have significant cracking so it is possible to have significant cracking. Uh, due to carbonation and it is very relevant for uh, systems where you have large quantity of cement being used. Now concrete can uh, creep and deform this is an example bridge which shows a creep deformation of concrete. Uh, you can see here for long period of time this bridge was not having this deflection and have slowly they observed this deflection at the mid span. If you look from the top of the bridge this is how it looks very clearly you can see this deflection over here. So the very heavy concrete element a lot of weight dead load is very very high dead load is very very high which eventually leads to uh, this uh, creep deformation. Now let us look at the freeze thaw attack. 
uh, free store in India, we don't have much of a problem with free store except in the northern uh, near the boundary where uh, northern boundary and some part of Rajasthan where you have very uh, extreme climate and the freezing and thawing can happen. See, like uh, if you are talking about a North Pole, it's always frozen or Antarctic if it's always frozen, there is no cyclic action. What we are worried about is the freeze thaw cycle that is more important to uh, consider. So, for example, if you look at North Pole, you will have less freeze thaw attack as compared to uh, as concrete in New York because New York, Chicago, those region they will have cold climate but not completely frozen all the time. So, you will have this uh, lot of cycles. There are places in uh, US where you, know, you can have 30 to 50 cycles of freeze thaw per year. So, you have to make a concrete so that if you want, uh, you know, if you have let us say 30 freeze thaw cycles per year and you want to design a concrete for 10 years. So, you have to ensure that this concrete will not degrade for about 350 cycles. So, that is how the design process goes on. So, what happens in this freeze thaw attack is as you see here layers of concrete the near surface layer is completely removed uh, and then here also you can see the near surface layer is removed. So, this is the uh, uh, freeze thaw attack how it looks like. So, what happens is moisture during the uh, winter season snow or uh, you know ice can actually melt uh, they, they will sit on the concrete surface it will uh, slowly melt and it will go into the or it will penetrate into the near surface once it penetrates into the near surface this uh, blue arrow shows its penetration into the near surface and this orange um, or yellow pores are indicating frozen water inside the concrete. That means the volume of this yellow is going to be more than the volume of the water. The, in other words, there is anomalous expansion uh, of ice, it can happen. So, ice has more volume than the water which will create some expansive force in the concrete eventually leading to cracking and crumbling of the concrete. So, the effect of air voids how it happens is so you have a small air void here. So, you can see there will be movement of the water this ice if there is a pressure being developed it will push the water to an available void somewhere nearby. Okay. So, this is a actually you can see the ice formation inside the void this this is a microscopic image of a void like this. So, this blue region here is what you see here. This is the ice and this is the air void and you can see ice crystals forming inside the air void. So, the idea of putting this air void is so that there is enough space available for this ice to form and expand, but without causing expansive stress. The stress will be generated if there is no air available. So, we put about 5 to 6 percentage of air to control freeze thaw attack. Okay. This is an example concrete where uh, you have a concrete specimen with air entrainment. We say air entrainment that means air is purposefully added to the concrete and it is distributed well within the concrete. So, you have enough air, small air voids available throughout the concrete where the size can form uh, without causing uh, stresses and cracking in the concrete. This is an example where there was no air entrainment and severely uh, severely damaged due to freeze thaw attack. This is the same uh, you know similar specimen, but with air entrainment very well protected against the freeze thaw attack. So, very clear demonstration that you can have very good concrete if you put 5 to 6 percentage of air in the concrete, but if you put more air then it is going to affect the strength of the concrete. So, you have to again optimize your uh, quantity of the air which you add. There are two more uh, mechanisms we will cover very briefly. Fire damage is another recently we have we are hearing a lot of incidences where fire uh, you know hazard is there buildings uh, if there is a fire uh, attack then uh, you can actually the what happens is there is very small poles available inside the concrete. So, this uh, heat penetrates 
into the concrete slowly and inner layers are not really much affected but the near surface layer is very much affected that's what you see here what happens is there is a bursting of uh, so the the uh, at this high temperature whatever moisture uh, vapor is available inside the concrete it can actually expand because of the increase in the temperature and it will burst the concrete that's a major mechanism by which the uh, uh, concrete uh, da gets damaged okay and if you are talking about steel rebar at uh, so once the near surface concrete is lost then you are exposing the rebars so at that high temperature the steel becomes very weak and uh, the structure will not be able to uh, sustain the loads or take the loads there is another deterioration mechanism of concrete is erosion which is very common in dam structures or you know where you have spillways uh, you know where you can see here this is actually happened due to uh, erosion i mean or cavitation and other actions so i think with that we will uh, stop this lecture on deterioration of concrete these are the references which we have been uh, using uh, in the slides and most of the pictures which were used for demonstration purpose has been taken from the internet um, thank you very much okay so we will uh, try to answer this uh, some of the questions which have been raised uh, first question is is there any admixture to avoid chemical attack on concrete there are several admixtures which we have been uh, discussing in the whole lecture uh, definitely we can use admixtures to avoid chemical attack uh, there are so again it depends on how you use the for example if i am using a better quality concrete with a highly impermeable concrete i can use an admixture to make the concrete highly impermeable so it's a very general question again the answer is yes uh, we can get then uh, how durability of concrete is affected by acid attack durability of concrete is affected with by acid attack the answer is when the concrete uh, is exposed to acid it attacks the concrete deteriorates the concrete so definitely you, the concrete will no longer be uh, durable uh, how to protect the concrete from acid attack how to protect the either you can provide a coating to the uh, concrete itself otherwise best way of doing is you make sure that your concrete is an impermeable concrete and uh, uh, highly resistant against acid can we use any chemical coating to prevent acid attack could be possible but uh, i don't know an answer for that uh, chemical coating to prevent acid attack maybe some coating or maybe even epoxy coating or something which can Uh, actually uh, uh, is resistant against that particular acid which you are uh, using so that could be so for example if it's in a chemical plant you have a particular chemical so you find a polymeric or some kind of uh, chemically resistant uh, coating material and provide it on the concrete surface yes the answer is can we use yes we can use will the reduced water cement ratio alone control the sulfate and acid attack i think i have shown a couple of slides with some graphs where it was very clear that just by reducing water cement ratio you get better resistance so answer yes will the reduced water cement ratio alone control the answer is yes but it depends on how much control you want whether the structure is going to meet the service life that answer you have to do by actually checking how much reduction you will get and is if that is sufficient go ahead otherwise you will have to go for other options uh, or other methods also how much strength of concrete is reduced by shrinkage so shrinkage if it is cracked definitely there will be significant reduction in the uh, strength of the concrete mainly the tensile strength can get affected uh, or in other words uh, the compressive strength i mean if the concrete is cracking i think we should not use that concrete so uh, there will be reduction in strength how much reduction that will depend on the type of concrete and how much cracks you have in that concrete so various factors are there to uh, play how the concrete can be prevented from acid rain uh, acid rain i don't know the answer for this i'll go to the next question uh, how the concrete can be prevented 
you provide a covering but i don't know the uh, right answer uh, what you are thinking now uh, how air voids help to relieve the pressure so as i showed in that picture so the air voids are larger than the so you see if there is no air void the ice when it is formed inside the concrete it will actually push against the cementitious surface but if there is air void the ice will try to expand but within the air void the ice will expand without actually hitting the surface uh, of the air void so there is no pressure being generated or no stress being generated so that's how uh, it works see more on this is a really uh, i would suggest to read the book on meta and montero which is a very very good book on uh, durability of concrete how to achieve uh, durability of concrete okay now is it pos another question is it possible to is it possible to make the concrete impermeable so that the melted snow does not enter the concrete in the first place and cause expansion of freezing yes it is possible uh, but we are talking about very very fine uh, pores so there is always a chance that some uh, moisture will get trapped inside will enter the uh, concrete so it is possible but uh, there will be a uh, possibility that mo some moisture will get in so you have to take care of that uh, moisture which gets in so the best way which people are seen is go for uh, entrained air uh, systems how do i prevent concrete from creeping so you have to design the concrete so that the creep coefficient or the uh, creep resistance is very very high you have to use uh, aggregate uh, better aggregate and better particle packing uh, so the different methods of actually uh, working around that so basically it is a mixed design which you have to work on and the materials which we use for concrete now can you explain about the laboratory test available to measure shrinkage of specimens yes so there are uh, methods where uh, we make uh, concrete uh, prism specimens and then ex uh, co prism specimens and then expose those prism specimens uh, to a particular uh, relative humidity uh, and temperature conditions uh, which need to be very well controlled both humidity and temperature and then you measure the change in the length of that specimen i think in one of the slides i have actually shown like in the asr slide if you actually go look at it uh, there is a length comparator uh, where the length change of the concrete prism uh, is measured similar test is adopted even for uh, testing shrinkage of concrete where we look at the change in the length of the specimen now given a few examples of uh, reactive aggregates uh, like uh, i don't know the example names but uh, dolomitic aggregates have uh, you know they are uh, known to be really reactive but also in india if you consider the aggregates which are available in the northern part it's uh, sometimes uh, found to be reactive in nature now how we can identify that the aggregate is reactive again we look at the we powder the aggregate uh, coarse aggregate into a smaller size and then we do some test on asr what we look at is how much the react the alkalinity like you powder the aggregate put it in some solution and just ch then check the alkalinity the change in the alkalinity of the solution to see the whether there is any uh, asr reaction is happening or not and other way of looking at is making the concrete specimens and then look at the length change then uh, what is the difference between normal concrete and pre stressed concrete in terms of creep value see the creep value that depends on what type of concrete is being used uh, so that again uh, you have to look into individual concretes okay but definitely pre stressed concrete can experience more creep uh, because of both the uh, dead load acting and at the same time uh, the compression force from the compressive stresses from the uh, pre stressing steel now what is uh, 
questions are keep coming should be can i complete these questions or okay so what is durability index i think this we will cover in part 3 so we will leave it for the next session what is ph value or concrete in general case that is about uh, definitely in uh, in the range of 12.5 plus or uh, 12 plus is the uh, ph value very high ph and in which value of ph is considered considerable is considerable for good concrete so like i just mentioned uh, very high ph so this also we will cover in part 3 which is good and bad in carbonation test then how to add air voids in concrete uh, adding air voids in concrete is by adding some air entraining agents like again chemical admixture which we put in the concrete so upon mixing they release air bubbles and then form, uh, form air and i mean air entrainment in the concrete what is freeze thaw cycle it is cycle that there where there is a temperature change i think more these are all very simple stuff you can also go through website there is enormous information available on what is freeze thaw cycle uh, the cycling of the change in temperature the point is you have to have a cycle where both freezing and thawing happen if the temperature is always below uh, freezing point then uh, there is no freeze thaw cycle it's only free uh, froze is completely frozen but in some locations you can experience freezing and thawing like for example late night you might have freezing late afternoon you might have some thawing happening so that is where uh, the problem lies fiber reinforced concrete frc is fiber reinforced concrete and pan fibers not pan filters it's pan fibers it's one type of fibers which are used in uh, fiber reinforced concrete and then what is the time log scale i think i would suggest to uh, you know this is same there is no difference be, uh, in a log scale is what you do is when you have very large for example if you look at that image in the left end of that image you have a time scale like you know which is in we are talking in uh, hours or weeks and then that scale goes all the way up to 30 years so if you use a normal scale linear scale then Uh, you will not be able to see what is happening in the uh, first few hours so in such cases to expand the left end of the graph we use a log scale to ex uh, so the right end of the graph we shrink left end of the graph you expand so you can see the effects on both short time scale and the larger time scale so that is what is log scale but these are basic stuff so uh, you just convert the uh, x axis numbers into log logarithmic uh, convert them into log and then that is the log scale the is codes do not allow air entrainment then how to protect concrete so sometimes if you know that there is a particular case i think is codes allow i don't i am not really uh, i don't know whether they don't allow or not so uh, first check that and even if they don't what you can do is you can use other codes and as an engineer we have uh, definitely we can use other uh, codes available uh, to uh, you know practice and one thing i would like to mention at this stage is codes are not mandatory codes you have uh, these are only you know guidelines where you can use them uh, but if required you don't need to actually there is nobody is forcing you to use the is codes these are actually regulatory codes uh, documents not the mandatory documents so if you know that the is code is uh, not giving some information and if you have uh, uh, information from other source please uh, go ahead and use it but then you have to be responsible for that that's the only uh, reason so you will be responsible for whatever you do as an engineer so we have to take calculated risk all the time okay thank you mm -hmm.